My name is uh, Peter Zaitsev. I am uh, founder and until recently CEO of uh, Percona, uh, 18 years uh, years old, right? Uh, 300 people uh, on staff uh, in uh, more than 40 countries. Uh, we have thousands of customers and uh, corner revenue is somewhere between 50 and uh, 100 million dollars a year. The reason why we did not didn't take any money at start. We're going to doing well with uh, revenue, right, with uh, customer money. Because it doesn't come with kind of dilution, right, or kind of some things like, oh, now I have a shareholder rights, and if you don't do what I believe is right for me, I'm going to take you to the court, right, and make your life miserable. I think for many people, it's uh, sort of like a focus more about raising, right? It's very hard and it takes longer. Uh, you know, I can speak from experience with bootstrapping our own startup, Algora. And bootstrapping means that if you're making sales, you're paying yourself a salary. And if you're not, you're not paying yourself a salary. And we've experienced that, not paying ourselves something for the longest time. We did contract work on the side to cover the bills. And, you know, finally, we have been able to go to the next step. And the way we approach it is we don't have to take the extremes. We are open to the scenario of in the future maybe raising, but maybe when the customer lifetime value has reached a certain point, when you know, there yeah. are certain things that need to happen first, and yeah. it's very closely tied with the business model of open source, mm -hmm. and, and, and the licensing is also part of that. Uh, again, the motivation here, much like with the rest of the podcast, we are open source founders ourselves, part of this new generation, let's call it, or new community of commercial open source founders. You know, it's only been one, two years that we're doing this. We don't know much. This podcast is an opportunity for us to learn. It's, it's selfish, but of course, to share those, those learnings with everyone else. And so you have transitioned consulting, professional services, support model, and then also cloud. There are different models out there with open code and with open source in general. We'd love to get sort of like a high level summary of what you've experienced works, what doesn't work, where are the pitfalls, and then we can talk about license. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course. Of course. Thank and you. let Thank me maybe just to, before we switch to that, kind of get the, like a you know final thoughts on the VC funding, right? Like mm -hmm. I uh, explained my position, especially as I kind of understood it um, uh, at that time, right? So it's like don't take it. Hey guys, you know what? Uh, don't ever ever take a mm -hmm. dollar off a of VC, right? Or you surely will, right? That's I just think said, in yeah. this case is uh, you know think about hey guys, what may happen, right? And uh, I think uh, also. In the more successful business you have, be able to raise on a better, better, right? You can see maybe some uh, people you, you heard like, like, you know, some public companies like, uh, you know, Facebook, maybe, maybe having the uh, Zach kind of still be able to, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, voting powers because he, you know, had a business which exactly. was uh, successful as a business, right? So he could dictate the terms. Oh, and Lord, when you have having a life-changing experience is like raising venture capital, because the thing is, once you brought somebody as a shareholder, unless there's something mm -hmm. unusual in your contract, it's like forever, right? Worst. Yeah. Then to say, I now want to part ways with you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shareholder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, going back to this kind of like an open source uh, and, uh, and a business model, right? And uh, like one thing I very much like about that, which goes like an open source is not a business model, right? Hey, that's as a license model, right? For software, uh, right? Or distribution for development, distribution. but not really a business model. And I think what is interesting, what you'll find is what a lot of companies build around open source, right? They are not solely open source. Often there is like a something which is being built in a very unusual situation. That's I'm saying, hey guys, don't look at what we are doing at Corner. Why? Mm -hmm. Because think about this, right? In our case, when it comes to MySQL, who does most of development? Frankly, Oracle is doing most, right? We're building MySQL, some, you know, uh, our additional bells and whistles, but that is like a smaller part. Right mm -hmm. in in this case, like slightly more simple and slightly cheaper thing compared to what Oracle is selling. That is not enough differentiation, right? Because like an open source and a property, right? This is different, right? And you cannot uh, bridge it. And I think here is important to understand is was startup and you are dealing with a large company. Mm -hmm. They can always wash you in terms of, you know, then I'm competing with choose to give away their software for free for all of the 
and then you'll be still fine because you know there is a 99 percent of the other deals right in their company which are not in competition right that is kind of very important so it's a very important so from my standpoint is what you have some sort of like a polarizing difference in your product compared to the to the competition and corner that uh, like an open source is a significant part of that right now if you are saying well you know i want to go ahead and do a massive greenfield development right and keep that yeah. whole open source and available for everybody else to use free of charge right that is often a very hard value proposition and that is why you often see folks even using this kind of cloud very cloud has some you know additional features you know, like i think about yeah. like a, it was this just uh, recently, uh, in the news of WordPress, mm -hmm. wherever it's like mm -hmm. automatic mm -hmm. or VP engine, hey, there is this kind of like a wonderful open source WordPress, but there is additional features what you have in the cloud, right? You know, maybe it's kind of more usability, security, you name it, right? But not uh, everything in that piece is uh, is an uh, is an open source, right? Or you know, somebody like AWS uh, does it. Also, mm -hmm. hey, even if they are sort of like a shrink wrapping of a MySQL or some other Postgres, some other open source technology, actually there is a lot of value, right? Because the skill required to run RDS Postgres versus installing that kind of, you know, kind of you know, completely, uh, you know, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I think really come in the form of in the form new features, for example, become in the form of a uh, cloud subscription. They can also come in the form of an enterprise license instead of being a company. Uh, purchases, purchases. Well, uh, yeah. So if you look at this case, right, what pretty much uh, I would say, like, with a very few exceptions, companies are doing, right? It goes into subscription. Now, subscription mm -hmm. revenue works very well for software, especially because the software also have to be kind of maintained, right? It's not like a music, right? Yeah. You can say, hey, you know what? I wrote it once, and now it can be replayed for, it, right? I mean, software needs to be always kind of patched, fixed, right? Otherwise, it becomes, uh, you know, unsafe. For you know, piece of junk, right? And that is best having the like subscription revenue to support that, that work, right? So, so what that even if you have enterprise subscription that typically is going one license fee, but it's kind of annual payments, or you have payments. Now, something else I think which is kind of interesting here, like, like think about the cloud versus enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. From what I've seen, you know, just if you're talking about a variety of companies, a lot depends on what competition exists, right? Okay. Because if okay. you're just saying, in this case, there is this kind of, you know, like a very successful, mm, you know, cloud going to be a own small cloud. Often it is a hard, uh, right, uh, lift. Why? Because the companies who are, for example, integrated thousand and kind of a sales team, right? the cloud right it's very natural for, and easy for them to use which happens here a lot of those other cloud double cloud announce hey they are shutting they have a lot like about like a three months your data right or we use it forever right and what that means is uh especially larger company they look at those smaller startup and say hey guys you know what if you commit it here if you right what if you run out of money i may be in a lot of trouble right of course i don't just if Amazon, right? But even if Amazon and those other cloud vendors, uh, some of the risks, they may decommission some services, right? Like, for mm -hmm. example, you may see, so the MongoDB, they uh, recently decommissioned Realm, right? And uh, and some other services. And hey, guys, well, you know what? Good news for you, right? Uh, now you have to rewrite your application in the next six months, right? Or you will, uh, you know, and these things, it won't work. These things, and these things that are related, these things that are related to, the point, to the previous point discussed about, discussed about uh, funding and sustainability. We've, we've seen you know, some services being sunset or some licenses changing in the industry, maybe in light, maybe of, in light of this this topic, right? This topic, right? But but uh, but what I was saying in this case, like if you have a startup, for a lot of companies can trust you a lot more in this case with that enterprise adoption. Right, mm -hmm. because in this case, first, a uh, number of companies, right, you say, hey, you know, I don't, I, I prefer to be like in some, in some cloud, right, and then somebody can say, hey, guys, you know what? You, now, what you yeah. said in this case is some, some companies like Amazon would have a dual license models, and hey, so, uh, if you're build, <clears throat> having a, a property, uh, by the line. now fast forward my MySQL developer, right, or the cloud, easy, to, and sell it if I would gain Oracle at that time. And that is, of course, create huge, um, uh, huge conflict there. And companies mm -hmm. feel, well, that mm -hmm. is kind of not super fair. 
have some anti-competitive hey guys you know we want to make sure it's only us with a lot uh and that brings us an interesting point right because mm -hmm. if, uh the communities are very interesting as a whole right the, the most changes and also computers may be changing there uh who was like a big dog for example SQL space a few years ago. Well it clearly was you know what I'm not going to be making a lot of money on MongoDB anymore. Other folks are going they are also going to maintain in the mm -hmm. would that be a right they are interested in the sex. They are thought you know to yeah, to make that's the uh, challenge. right. That's, it's more challenging, it's more sustainable, it's more and monetized, you monetize, 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 all the value, all the value. You Although you get some, you get some people and people telling what happens at the extreme case when someone might someone might just take your code, take your code, go ahead and commercialize it on their own, just rip it. What do you tell people? What do you tell people? Yeah. So look, what I think in this case, right? It's interesting thing in the open source. I think what we discussed in the early days, right? Human being. You have a choice, right? For example, I spent some time, right? So my take in this case is, look, it's totally fine to have an open features. And here to make a balance, uh, like a, mm -hmm. right, an open kind of like license change. Well, they actually promised, right? Both he and the company promised say, open source. The only extensions which we created will be, right? And then in this case, and that is what kind of community is pissed about. Right? Uh, you have to understand the open projects, right? They succeed. Yes, this is kind of cool. I found, and it's all force. Go and use it. All those things in Redis, there have been, you know, many, many conditions done besides the Redis, the home point, uh, uh, to get the customers. Because most people at that is a, uh, uh, you know, have a blowback. But now I would say, I think even if you look at something like single vendor open source, right? But the Redis is like. A, they change their life, my so change or open source fork, right? So that is kind of my thing also like the uh, make it less for uh, uh, people. Can, exactly. Just to bring it a little closer to home, people like ourselves who started this year uh, an open source project or other founders out there. Uh, we can actually pull up this reference on Twitter, something that happened just the past few days. Um, where basically this new YC company forked a project of another YC company uh, without really telling many people about it. And now there's a huge um, storm on Twitter about it. I don't know if you had the chance to to check it out. The company is called Peer AI, uh, and they forked continue.dev. You know, this is probably like a bunch of 20 something year olds on both sides who don't know any better. They probably, they probably didn't think through much about the legal aspects and just wanted to go ahead and ship the, you know, some, some hearts are broken here. Some people are pissed. Others are like, whatever. So yeah. Practically, you know, it's, it's challenging to navigate this and, and speaking from experience, right? So yeah, yeah. look, I mean, I, uh, I totally agree. Right. And I think this is uh, like, I will say kind of a few things, right? Uh, well, first in the, in the open source space, there is a very big kind of difference and say, Hey, what is legal? you are allowed to do right with uh, what will be considered to be good by community right and, and i think that those things are you know not uh, That's always a the same right like for example all those kind of license changes by mongo or by redis right all they have been you know totally legal right but they have not been you know, appreciated by you know by community right and i think this is kind of goes in this case well and then you mentioned well, look, the thing with open source, right, is you can take that code, right, and embed it in your product, mm -hmm. and you don't actually, you can kind of modify it, and you don't have to tell anyone. You know, think about Grafana, for example. Yeah. I have seen countless local forks of Grafana, right, where Grafana is kind of being embedded in that product, right, where it shipped with some words, maybe, you know, some different law stuff like that. Look, if the project is open source, that means you, you know, you can use it, like, 
fork it and use it according to the terms of, of a license that is out there, right? Some people might not like it, right? But again, like, I think, like, I don't know, like realities, right? For example, pretending something you are not, right? Saying, oh, we worked here for five years, right? To bring this stuff to you, right? When it's actually, you know, so you just fork somebody else's code, right? And put the new name and logo on it, right? Well, that's what that form, right? Uh, right. And yeah, that's kind it of- It happens and it might not even be legal, legal. Just, just run upon it. And, and, you know, I feel like, you know, have like a whole other hours just discussing this one single topic. I mean, you know, you know, hope to bring up actually our own license or talk about the OC definitions and all that. But but I know we have limited time, so I definitely want to cover some some more bases. And one of them switching topic is enterprise sales, which I know as a founder, you had to do a lot of in the beginning. But as you grew, you brought in more people in the team to help with that, making it more practical. Also, you work with a bunch of founders today that you advise them and you have invested in them. What are some common maybe pitfalls that you see as some mistakes people do as far as pricing, packaging, and the whole sales motion? Yeah. Yes. So I'll uh, mention kind of like a few things, uh, no, a few things here, right? First, we talk like about like an enterprise sales, but I think it's very important to understand, okay, for this project, how exactly your kind of a marketing and sales motion is going to work. Right, because mm -hmm. you can find some products are very successful with enterprise sales. Some projects like a very successful with more kind of like a developer kind of viral sales. Right, say, hey, you know what? I have a developers which are you know paying you know a few bucks right on their credit cards, right? Sure, yeah. And in some cases, it's even kind of works both. Right, you can think about let's say maybe several developers right, from a large company which can go ahead for their sales. Right, right. to understand what they you know what to, uh, what to, you know. Uh, to to sell them specifically, right? Uh, in in my opinion, mm -hmm. if you look at the like more of an enterprise sales, what I see the problem for many kind of founders is if they kind of uh, if they come from engineering background, you mm -hmm. often kind of even this kind of from this kind of enterprise. Uh, for example, like what well, I remember myself, right? I would give me fifty thousand dollars, right? Wow, that is kind of shit. Right, but then you understand then for enterprise against oh we don't say fifty right now we're spending like a five million dollars if or data dog or whatever right so those kind of enterprise sales like uh, the bigger sales they often come with uh, longer cycles and mm -hmm. there is much more to the sale than to the sale. Uh, the sale. You often see like uh, they kind of spend oh, right, but they have to get shitload of companies everybody may say oh there's like a compliance and there is like a security guys and you have to kind of go and kind of get like a 17 signature sort of like on the thing to make it uh, uh make it uh, close right and that's kind of very kind of special to to navigate right which is again very different maybe like a startup founder if we do have some other founder can say hey you know like you know, i have a you know thing which can solve the problem oh what is it okay good deal Right, uh, yeah. you know, 15 minutes later, right, you may have like already, you know, signed and uh, and paid, right? So I think that is a very important, right? And in Pircona, we kind of had an evolution in this case, like, and I would call it like maybe like a three stages. The first off, it was uh, like a founder sales. Myself, right, and a couple of other people would do some uh, initial sales, right? And I think that's like a very special because as a founder, you have a kind of different cloud. Right, because uh, you understand your reputation at stake, right? You typically have more understanding. People trust you more compared to this kind of, you know, you know, commission-based uh, salesperson, right? Like in this case, which will, you know, again, not all of them are this way, but many people will think, oh, you know, you, this person is in commission. He will tell you whatever he thinks you want to hear to close the deal. Right. That is different from mm -hmm. a founder, right? Especially if you do like sort of, you know, like a, a founder to founder kind of exactly. uh, a sale, right? So that is uh, the first stage for us. The second one, we had uh, gradually built what's called inside sales team, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, this kind of like an, um, uh, you know, maybe kind of confusing term, but this is kind of maybe people who are focused on the relatively small deals, okay. right? They are who would be, uh, you know, somebody comes and say, uh, you know, we are looking for support. Right, and you can say, okay, cool, right? Like, how many notes have maybe answered some of the questions, right? And then go to kind of like a larger enterprise sales. You know, think about, you know, 100,000, uh, half million dollars and more, right? Then for us, it was more of a solution sales, right? You have an enterprise 
to, you need the sales people who are actually capable of first understanding the customer's problem. It's so, so like, you know, constant learn from, you know, companies like Oracle, what you are like, what is your problems, right? How does our solution so portfolio fits, right? How does that fit with your, your company's goals, right? Are you guys maybe moving off, let's say, proprietary database to open source database? Are you guys moving to cloud? Are you guys planning to grow kind of 10x and your challenges you can't hire staff? So our, Mongo, uh, our managed services maybe you feel, right? You need to have that kind of very much understanding. In that case, right, is your goal is to spend most of your time at understanding your customer needs. So you can craft that for them, right? So I think that is another important angle of the enterprise and is new. Right? Often they're called like hunters. These are different who are good at working with your existing customers. To ensure maybe, you know, like add more uh, something like different financial mix, right? You often would pay maybe like 10 times as much for bringing the dollar of recurring revenue compared to, uh, right? so I think that was also very, very important. Uh, mm, uh, important. And, and, and I've heard like, I don't remember where, but something to the contrary, as far as whether customer success and sales and even marketing should be working, should be working together, together closely, closely, but your opinion is different incentives. No, no, well, uh, look, what I'm saying is uh, they have to be working closely, for sure, sure. Okay. right? Like in this case, right? But what uh, what I'm saying is uh, working close and being kind of the same guy is kind of different things. It's like the same thing like you're saying, I want to be a person who do with sales and marketing. Well, unless you're kind of founder and you have to do kind of but this marketing is often kind of like a long range come and, uh, you know, for right. flourishing at many quarters or years, kind of all over the place. I want to sell and I want to do yada yada, right? They would not be able to goals set on a consistent basis, right? So, uh, so you, you separate the roles point, right? And you as a founder, negotiate in terms of legal agreements, providing the quote, oh my God, kill, kill me now, right? That's <laughs> that, like, you know, totally, totally not. Got it. The, this is a great distinction. Thank you for, for highlighting these differences. Makes sense. And then yes. you're taking yes. our own yes. lessons, lessons from this. From because we're like because at the top, like of, the top hour, of the hour and how much time you have. I definitely have, wanted I definitely to touch, wanted on, touch whether on whether you could leave people, could leave people, with, people some, with some, like as an entrepreneur. The other one, I was just like, go. But it applies also. This person has been you know, leading the sales for Yara. The skills you need are opposite. Sure, is that you are hiring people who understand what working at your scale means. Right? And you need to people, you know, can X to Z, right? But often that is going from a million dollars to 10 million in a company that a number of those kind of okay, high level people, right? And you overpay for skills you don't need, right? And, and that's a, end up being a lot of wasted money time, which is also important. In this case, successful entrepreneurs, successful CEOs, they come in all kinds of enterprises. Martin Makers, he is this kind of, you know, like a Brad Pitt like you looking guy, very well spoken, good looking, very polished. Right? And I say, oh my gosh, I really not like him. As a CEO, you have a view, right? Which can over some people. Which, so I think that's and the third one I would say uh, probably is this growth question. Right? I believe what mm -hmm. all what the CEO has in a small startup, kind of a larger startup, kind of Changes, right in this case, right, and and you need to grow with that, like a grow, every, right, and for example, for me, I decided that kind of step to it because I figured, well, you know, what I'm kind of a zero to one, I kind of uh, you know, the early startup, you you know, you know, move fast, everything. And I think like some, well, you know, I am kind of CEO, I have to be in no other choices, and that may be people in a bad situation. With their personal happiness and mental health, as well as um, yeah, as well as really, really, appreciate really appreciate you highlighting, you highlighting, highlighting this and the advice taking the advice closely, closely. Um, um, as a fellow as a founder in the days, 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 days at this point. So I mean, obviously we are not like a you know largest uh, company, but uh, 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 but you know I probably cannot call us like startup <laughs> anymore as well. I understand you made the transition from consulting to a more support model, but also cloud. 
Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. The bulk of our business is a support. Right, so that cool. is kind of so uh, you know subscription fixed fee up per year, right? And we came to that because that is in the end the better way to keep our customers successful. Because if you just have kind of a consultant, right, it's all about like an hours. Oh, we get billed by like a ten hours, right? And you it's and the customer kind of line. focus on yeah. that. Oh, is that kind of ten hours? So is it five? Should it have only taken three? Right? It's kind of you know, mm -hmm, bizarre. Mm -hmm. And then also you're kind of really not motivated to improve your, like if you say, hey, hey, guys, a million dollars to build the software. So instead of to take three hours, exactly. well, what you're is not a commercial proposition to do that? Absolutely. Just, you know, to review, reduce uh, uh, your biddings, right? And where it's completely opposite in the support, right? Where, hey, you know what? We are providing the outcome of security assurance to a customer, we, you know, fix the bugs, we help them to do the kind of stuff. And that, that comes with a fixed fee, right? So we are actually interested to optimize things as much as possible, to have our software as high quality as possible. So there is as little defects as possible, so we don't have the time, you know, to, uh, to fix them, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of much more aligned. Right. And the second reason for this model is, of course, a lot of when you start investing in the software, right, uh, you need like a predictable, sustainable revenue to kind of to hire engineers exactly. so they can work on something for many months or maybe kind of years. Right? And we've consulted with kind of a lot, uh, a lot of ebbs and flows, right, in industry, right? And because margin, then, probably. Probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the margin is a lot lower. Yeah. So we have uh, transitioned uh, where most of our business is uh, either uh, support, right, which is uh, high margin, uh, recurrent business, right? And uh, I call it support, but it also has some other things, right? We have a provide people access to the knowledge base and, you know, mm. some other things beyond, you know, just break, fix uh, uh, support, right? Then support is focused on the customers which have some sort of experts in a database on their team because, well, you know what? Mm -hmm. You need some sort of experience to ask the right questions and to be able to follow instructions. If you're saying, hey, I just have like a developers. I don't want to deal with database at all. Databases are scary. Databases are stupid, right? Whatever. Don't want to do, uh, do them, right? Then we have managed services, right? That is when we take it over managing databases fully, uh, you know, completely and um, and I, and that is more kind of fully managed than what mm -hmm. cloud likes to, to call fully managed, right? Because we do take a lot more responsibility for, you know, ensuring your application works, right? If you say you have some, you know, bad queries or bad, you know, security practices, well, our team will actually not, right, to make those things in this case, right? Or implement changes what's, uh, you know, like adding the indexes or some other stuff which are in our uh, control, right? And yes, and we still have, uh, you know, some consulting, some, but that is sort of like more like a spice, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that is uh, uh, important for that kind of, especially enterprise, you can say, oh, fantastic, adopting per corner for our, our organizations, but we go when you go to, you know, to Microsoft, to Oracle or whatever, they can train our staff to use software. I mean, in open source community, we are trained to figure things out. Hey, there is docs, there is source code. What the hell do you need? Right? The source code is best documentation, right? But that is not how things work in enterprise, right? They expect to, oh, I have done this kind of education. Maybe I even got certified. Now both myself and my manager all be qualified. So that is all history of Percona. So tell, tell us about that, about the decision early on, how it played out over the years. I'm sure you had opportunities. I'm sure people were annoying you yeah. to give you the money, yeah. right? So, Well, uh, there are a couple of things uh, here connected, right? Uh, one is, for me, it's probably like a two reasons for that. Like one is coming from that. I kind of hold PTSD from uh, experience, right? Of SQL, raising venture capital at that time, right? And that was kind of Change a lot in the company. You know, open source, right? And then raise the money and say, well, you know what? People gave us money because they expect to go and you know. And so we focus on making our share. Of, you know, after a couple of Money. Some people don't understand that. They raise the money from limited partners, you know, maybe some right. pension funds, endowments, like, and those people, they are kind of disconnected from the project, you know, like no matter what, if their CEO is going to be on something else, then right, 
uh, growth out counts well, that in place. Always like to say the big words, right? Because nobody comes out there and say, hey guys, you know what? We are just greedy bastards. We care about the money. Of course, everybody is caring about everything else, kind of a uh, culture, but <laughs> Well, the money is their the motivation structure, right? And I believe, right, in this case, and I still believe, hey, you know, if you really want to be kind of in a control, if you own in terms of creating a difference, the individual playing with your own money and if you own, you have a choice, right? Many people, for example, they work and they, you know, may choose causes, right? It's to entrepreneur, but on a bigger, mm -hmm. uh, bigger scale, right? And I also, very actively participate in uh, open source community, you know, besides involvement with, uh, with Firpona, as well act as a founder and, uh, you know, investor advisor to, uh, you know, typically in, in open source or internet infrastructure space. So yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal. that's Thank me. So first time we, met, first was time we met was about a year ago, about a year in, ago in, in Greece, Greece for Perkona University. For University. Uh, yeah, before that, that, before that, it was Istanbul, it was actually. Istanbul, so you do one of these every year, right? right? There right. must have been many countries. I mean, uh, it's not like in like one of those every year, right? This, this year we did one in Istanbul and uh, Berlin and Budapest and uh, a few others also like coming up. Uh, um, uh, to do, we are planning to do one in, uh, in Vietnam. So typically, I mean, I like, uh, this kind of opportunity to meet the mm -hmm. local community, right. In many different places worldwide. And I think that's always very interesting and kind of rewarding to see how you can think this, you know, like an open source community, right. Which is kind of on one extent, like a truly global, but then also how so, it is different in a different uh, place in the world, right? So I think that's kind of eye-opening for me running those events in all kinds of different countries. And the Bergogna University in Athens was actually the first conference, the first tech conference, tech conference, conference I ever went, I ever went to. to. So I, I really appreciate I really that appreciate opportunity. That opportunity and, and, and my understanding is that it's not just for the community, but it's also for your team to have the chance to get together, get together and then do some do outdoor activities as well when you're, you're a fan of adventure and sports. Sport. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, you're right, right? I think uh, what uh, I like, like, and, and I think that's kind of mainly like a startup mentality, right? To say, hey, if you do something, get all benefits of mm -hmm, that what you mm -hmm. can, right? And if you think about like the university, uh, there's multiple of them. Like one, this is event, uh, we work with the local Pirconians to help to organize. And I think one of the best team buildings you can have is like then we get together and sort of have some, you know, fun projects put together and that mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, becomes one the many people you know don't they see each other uh, right so that's kind of a can you know can meet uh you know together while working on the process yeah, i uh, i love doing that and yes you mentioned in uh, with some of uh, right that's also mm -hmm. i think it's kind of my other passion and like mixing business with pleasure Right. I think a lot of like a classical network is kind of very boring. For me, hey, you know what? Let's maybe go climb the mountains together, right? Or let's go, hey, you, you, you're going to go to the mountains, but you better train. You better get your ass off your seat, right? And go for a run, right? To go for a dream so you can actually do this adventure stuff, right? And I think that's like, I heard at least, right? Some people also found that very rewarding to keep them, to have that kind of a motivation believe that, uh, believe to be that. able to do that. For sure. Um, before Percona, I worked at MySQL AB, right? And now it's interesting. That now people may not even kind of remember that, but the MySQL uh, uh, used to be owned by this very nice kind of Swedish company, and uh, I used to work there, right? And then it's kind mm -hmm. of uh, I can figure out how to do services around MySQL better, and that's how Percona was created, right? It to, to really focus on your customer, focus on your customer needs, because what I kind of discovered mm -hmm. at that time is what, if you think about uh, a lot of consulting, which exists in the industry, it's kind of sort of like a glorified sales, which you also pay for to do kind of to sell mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. right? If you hire Oracle consultants, for example, what are we going to tell? 
well, this is how you should deploy more Oracle and pay us more money. And that's pretty much applies to any kind that of commercial sense. company, right? So I mean, like the idea is, hey, you know, if you actually maybe like break even, even kind of lose money on consulting, right? Just to to, uh, uh, to sell more stuff, right? And our idea with Percon, and I think that was worked very well for us in the first years was we are going to be focus kind of solely on on the, on the customer we are not paid by mm -hmm. anybody else it's like uh a really consulting i think a lot of people you know understood the value of such approach right and that's uh, helped us uh help us to grow right in those uh, early years right and what also helped us to grow is what uh, we kind of got lucky in the market because uh, mm -hmm. the mysql ab as some may know was acquired by sun microsystems and that was you know, the eaten gap. by even the bigger fish, Oracle, mm -hmm. right? And for that, there was a lot of those like turbulence and the Pircona was a very kind of safe alternative compared to that, right? Because we were just getting better. We have not been, you know, going through that process of, uh, you know, integrating the teams and systems, right? Which mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. comes um, with uh, friction. Right. Then over time, we expanded beyond MySQL, all right, and beyond consulting. So if you think about Kona now, we provide uh, open source uh, platform and solutions to run the databases, uh, MySQL, Postgres, uh, MongoDB, though that is kind of partially source available, right, to be kind of very specific here. And we're also starting to work with Valky. right, uh, Redis, uh, uh, Redis, uh, Redis uh, alternative. The important differentiator for your corner, which was there kind of from the day one, we are very serious at the open source. All the software which we do and ship to the customers, right, is open source, right? So if you think about your corner server for MySQL, which is our extended and improved MySQL variant, it has like all enterprise features you would want, right? like for example, what MySQL Enterprise provides, but it is open source. And I believe that is a very important, right? Because what that means is our customers and our relationship with customers are much more balanced, right? Because uh, uh, they are in open source, right? If we are becoming, you know, greedy or if our quality becomes bad, they can actually can fire us and keep our software or fire us and kind of hire somebody else to support them. There is actually a number of companies which also would be happy to, you know, su support you on, uh, on Percona products, right? And on one extent, that may sound like, you know, like a scary to empower mm -hmm. your customers to fire you, right? A lot of people will say like, that's a bad business. But to me, I think that is also very good path uh, to be great or dead. Right. There is no choice to be in that kind of state of mediocrity, right? Which I don't know, for me is always kind of exciting, right? I mean, because, well, mm -hmm. I don't want to be running mediocre uh, uh, company. So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, many years later at the state uh, uh, right now, we support uh, all those database technologies, have like a lot of open source software uh, we implemented. I wonder if you could, uh, you might, uh, you might want to um, end uh, this with this telling, us, telling us has been going, has been going live your life since, since you left you Percon left as the CEO. Of course, CEO. you're the founder, uh, still involved. Yeah. Uh, you know, what do you have yeah, going, yeah, going, what do you have personal your and professional? Yeah, 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 thank you. No, thank you, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, not everybody knows, I owe kids pretty young, so at the same time, my youngest is now in college, right? And so I can tell you, I finally have my in my 40s because I didn't, uh, I mentioned in this uh, project, uh, Geeks uh, Go P, like a passion project, right? I want to bring in more of that, uh, uh, you know, passion for adventure I have to their open internet kind of community uh, at large. I know, I know, I know you're on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, so, LinkedIn, so anyone, anyone can get in touch. Get in touch. Uh, so, uh, so you'll be able to. Be able to yes, use. yeah, absolutely. Uh, links out there if you're. Will do. Uh, Will do. Amazing. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for the opportunity to this live stream uh, on the Open Source, the open source, source Founder podcast. podcast. I will let you know once they're out.